Hi, so I'm here to talk to you uh, about the distributions from the view of a package where if you are the upstream package owner or package maintainer, what it is like to work with distributions. So, so um, who here works on a distribution? Wow. Who here works as an upstream package? Okay, so some of you also have similar experiences possibly with working with these distributions. For about six months, I've been at the CTO office at Percona, and Percona does all forms of MySQL and MongoDB, and you know we make all these open source tools that are 100% op obviously open source. <laughs> and then before that, I was on the founding team of MariaDB Server. I left because they stopped making open source software. <laughs> so first and foremost, um, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the packagers, because you do a wonderful job. We make software. And if we don't get them into distributions, or and distributions mean a lot of things nowadays, including you know Docker images and so forth, we don't actually get adoption. Adoption is crucial for us to continue wanting to make better software, because only then will we know if there are bugs or you know we did something silly and so forth. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about my experiences with the MySQL ecosystem because. I've spent a lot of fairly long time on the MySQL ecosystem. In fact, this gentleman here, Lens, has also spent quite a bit of time at the MySQL ecosystem, though he, he left us maybe five years ago <laughs> or seven years ago, yeah. So MySQL has been around now for 22 years. It's pretty old software. How many of you use MySQL? Okay. So the rest of you use it and don't want to admit you're using it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so MySQL is, is, is old. I mean, it started you know, in 1986 with Unirag, and you know, it was a, just a text UI to an ISM data store. You had very simple rows written to disk. Just then you added indexes on top of that, so you have these MyISM and form files, FRM files, which are formed to enter data. And all, these, all of this is changing as MySQL 8 comes alive, right? Form files are going away. There'll be no more FRM files. There'll be SDI files in, inside of, uh, you know, uh, InnoDB, and there's also JSON. So that's like a huge positive as well. So no more FRM files. Uh, Procona Server, also been around for a fairly long time. As a company, it's been around 10 years. The server's now nine years old. MariaDB, seven years old. You know, February 1st was its uh, release, first ever release. We've also seen things like WebScale crop up. And uh, if you're interested in some of the people who made WebScale, they're at the MySQL dev room right after this talk. <laughs> Not that I'm telling you to move. <laughs> um, yeah, and WebScale doesn't really exist nowadays because that was the idea of having a consortium of people to work um, on making MySQL better for people like Google and Facebook and Twitter and so forth because upstream being Oracle weren't so so kind in terms of accepting patches without signing the Oracle contributor agreement. MySQL for what it's worth didn't start off as GPL software, it only became GPL in 2000 and uh, you know, more often than not, you may have some embedded device still still working from, from those days running 3.23 GA. It's still one of the most popular old distributions of MySQL around. Um, you shouldn't use it, really. <laughs> then there are a whole bunch of other 4.0 releases and 4.1 and, and so forth. But it is very well worth noting that it was around the time MySQL became GPL that the software license for the client connector changed from um, um, LGPL, which is the lesser general public license, to the GPL, which meant that if you were going to embed it, now you'd have to get a license exception. And it took a while before we even got something known as a forced license exception. Because, and the reason forced license exception came about was largely because distributions didn't want to touch MySQL, with the, the new MySQL with a 10-foot pole. They were worried about linking, say, PHP, or Perl against the GPL lib MySQL client, which would then possibly mean that those applications would also have to become GPL'd. So the false license exception came about. And of course, MySQL grew to fame uh, uh, around the 90s during even the web 1.0 days, largely because of replication and scale out. So you'd have uh, you know, a, a famous website like Slashdot. Do people still read that? 
still exists. It still exists, yes, but I don't know if anyone still reads it, though. Slash was started around 20 years ago, actually, and um, they were big MySQL users and probably still are. <coughs> so, to talk a little bit about um, licenses and license exceptions, it, you know, I, I don't know how many of you remember Alan Cox, big, big guy in the Linux world, and uh, still is. And he was also very adept with, with licensing as well. MySQL changing the client libraries from LGPL, which made MySQL with a lot of stuff like PHP infeasible. This could have hurt MySQL adoption had there not been a FOSS exception. And a lot of other people, around this time, the Fedora project was also um, starting, and Fedora was like, no, we don't really want to include uh, a new MySQL. And it was only then that you get a FOSS license exception. Uh, and this is what Richard Stallman himself refers to as parallel licensing. And why, why does MySQL need to have this parallel license or a dual license? Very simple. Back then, if you were going to embed a MySQL connector and you wanted to use it for commercial applications, say, you know, um, you were a hardware ma manufacturer making a router, back then there were even phone companies doing it, and uh, even uh, like software like fo Photoshop even. So generally the idea is they need to pay a license fee, but FOSS, FOSS software doesn't need to pay a li any, any license fee, hence the FOSS exception. Did you have a question? Well, to be fair, the FOSS license ex exception is different from the dual license. Yes, of course. The uh, exception basically broadens this or, or lowers for the, the, the terms of the GPL and makes it more compatible with the other. With the others, yes. FOSS license. Yes, but uh, yeah, but we need to also talk about the dual license because we need to we needed a way to make uh, revenue, <laughs> and that was really why there was a, a dual license. Yeah. And uh, the false license exception allowed MySQL connectors to actually finally go into the distributions. And why is this important, right? Like, if you, if you want to move software forward, you don't really change the old releases. You keep on changing the new client libraries to make it better. And if the distributions don't ship the newer client libraries, you're actually hurt because whatever cool stuff you have in the server that the new client library needs to access, people can't use. So. This was, was a crucial decision to make a, a license exception so that it gets shipped. But it, we still continued on with a dual license, and we actually, MySQL till today has a dual license for what it is worth. But this first exception still is, is, is available on the, on the website. It hasn't changed since 2012. Distributions are also very interesting because Every time you make a new release of a client library, you have to make sure the application binary interface doesn't break because you have to then rebuild possibly hundreds of packages that link against it. And this, this is an example from 2006, but the same example happens in 2016 when Debian, for example, is replacing MySQL with MariaDB and everything has to be rebuilt against libMariaDB client. In fact, this move is happening right now. So if you join the package MySQL main list, is anybody on that? It's a wonderful mailing list because, well, now it gets such high traffic. I mean, people are complaining that, you know, MariaDB is not drop-in, MariaDB is, is breaking their software, and we're, we're learning a lot of new things uh, that we didn't know because Debian is clearly diverse. So they don't like to rebuild hundreds of packages, and obviously ABI should never break. This came from the packages mailing list. Now, the packages mailing list for MySQL, unfortunately, is still fairly, is kind of dead, as is the internals mailing list. But this is something that even distributions and people who are making packages actually complain about, because they, they need a place to discuss things with the upstream developers. And if the upstream developers don't provide that, this is bad from a, from a distribution standpoint as well. So MariaDB, for example, has its own packages mailing list where it tells you, hey, you, there's going to be a new release. And it's, it's very similar with, with Percona. And um, MySQL currently is more like, here, we're going to drop something on you. And this is the whole, we're going to drop something on you is usually like when there's CVEs and so forth. And uh, that typically happens at least once every three months because Oracle has what is known as a critical patch update day once every three months, and then you get a new, new release. And MySQL itself gets a release once every two months. Now, when it comes to speed of releases, 
I would say Fedora and Ubuntu really primed this nine month distribution cycle, maybe even six months, six to nine months, they release very quickly. Now, database software, a little bit more complex than, than this, and the idea was to also make you know, nine month releases, but the reality is we make 24 month releases, and this is across the board for MySQL and MariaDB as well. And the, the real problem we face as upstream is that if we make a release today and you ship something, you are now shipping something that is possibly outdated for a very long time. And we, get, and we make new feature, new feature fixes in the next release, which people don't get. And Red Hat has found sort of a way, workaround for this. They have what is known as software collections, or SEL, which sort of actually helps in this, in this scenario. But this, the speed and velocity doesn't actually work out very well for upstream people. Now, if you take a distribution like RHEL or, or Ubuntu, which has lo or, or even SUSE, which has long enterprise support, you now also have to support the software for the lifetime of the distribution. So imagine if, you take, if you've taken two-year-old software, packaged it, and now you tell us, hey, you've got to support this for, for another eight years. That's 10 years of supporting software that we really didn't want to support more than five years. And th th this is actually a, a real life problem. Um, so uh, again, RHEL 7 ships, you know, MariaDB server 5.5. And the reality is RHEL 7 will only end, end its first level of support, I think, on the quarter four of 2020. And 5.5 was released in you know, 2014, which is longer than anyone wants to support. And this is again very true from a, even from a Procona standpoint where we need to start thinking about deprecating modules inside. So if you want to deprecate an engine even, we have to think very carefully about how long this, this is going to take. We do realize what ships and releases matters. And this is the and this is amazing thing you get about uh, you know, statistics uh, or whatever little statistics we get out of Popcorn. Uh, which Debian does provide, is that what is the default really does get used a lot. Because mo more often than not, people just say, I want to install WordPress. WordPress pulls in MySQL. And people don't care that they're running MySQL, they just care that they're running WordPress. And this is true even for, you know, Akonadi and, and so forth. And, um, you know, you'll see that MySQL 5.1 is really popular, and I, I believe I took this out actually from Ubuntu. Why is it popular? Because Ubuntu LTS releases are more popular than every other Ubuntu release that comes out. MySQL 5.1 has been end of life for a very long time, but a lot of people are using it. So they are using it with potentially lots of security holes, and they don't know it. Distributions can make something, make, make upstream's life a lot easier by giving us statistics. Distribution statistics are extremely sparse. If we look at Fedora and OpenSUSE, they used to have statistics several years ago, but they don't have. Even, even simple things like mirror statistics of how many people pull downloads, we, we do not get. So statistics are extremely sparse. Um, we, we, are, we are getting some stats out of things like Debian and Ubuntu's popcorn, but I'm sure no one in this room runs popcorn, right? Don't you, rely on popcorn. Yeah, you can't it's rely on popcorn. popcorn. It's, not it's like what? Yeah, but it's fake news. It's fake news, yes. <laughs> but in the absence of real news, fake news will suffice. <laughs> and this is especially important for. Um, it's also important for MySQL and Procona. Uh, but it is extremely important for MariaDB server because it is a venture-backed company and you've got to impress the venture capitalists every month. You've got to say, look, we, we had extra downloads, it's so good. So statistics like Docker and Juju, they actually give you statistics. Kind of useful, but we need more stats. And also when you hear you know, random quotes like this, and this, this I picked out from a MariaDB press release, they, say they have a 12 million strong community. But then if you look at phone home data, I, I see Lens gr grimacing. If you look at the phone home data, because MariaDB server actually includes a little phone home thing to report what is being used in the server. It is off by default, no one turns it on. And if you, if you believe 12 million, and you look at the phone home data which I picked 
in December of 2016, you've only got 12, 000, a little over 12,000 users. So is it 12 million or 12,000 users? Hmm, that's a huge, huge difference in numbers. So again, possibilities of fake news. And then of course we think about support tiers. The beauty of Linux is that we have so many distributions, but if you are upstream, you really, care, you really do care more about bugs that are reported in say RHEL and you know, Debian and Fedora as opposed to bugs reported in something like GhostBSD. There are, there are definitely tiers, if we don't tell you, but we, we have them internally. And um, you know, some distribution vendors also do end up getting a, like a level three support agreement with various upstreams to make sure that those bugs get fixed. And that's actually quite useful. Database servers are like a distribution themselves, especially when they're like in the MySQL ecosystem because we support storage engines, we support plugins. And in fact, if you do a show plugins on you know, a random, um, say, MariaDB, you might find 130 plugins or something available for you. And we realize things like when you require malloc libraries, like, like JE malloc, for, at, at one stage it didn't actually work on FreeBSD. This actually takes work around because otherwise this engine stops working on that platform and we need to care about all platforms. Um, libjudy is not provided in, in pretty much any distribution and this prevents uh, an open OQ graph, which is a graphing engine for, for MariaDB and MySQL to not work. And this now means we have to provide libjudy packages, which then makes things extremely complex. Some people run Power 8, for example, and uh, Extra Backup works wonderfully well on x86, but not so on, on Power 8. And there are a whole bunch of things, like what happens when the server, because MariaDB server now includes Galera cluster, requires all these other tools like IP route and rsync, and in, in some instances, now it's pulling this and people go when they're updating from MariaDB server 10.0 to 10.1, they go, why is MariaDB asking for all of this? This is insane. Also, another very important thing that you know, would be nice if uh, we got um, fixed from a distribution standpoint is when we go out for consulting gigs, sometimes we, we uh, encounter people that say, look, we need to have all these packages installed, but we will not allow you to get on the internet. Hmm. Now RPM can do dependency resolution. Dpackage, we find, we find it really, really hard to deal with resolving dependencies when you're offline. This needs fixing. CPAN, even you have mini CPAN, you can take things offline. In the MySQL world, we love CPAN, we love CPAN and Perl a lot. So when it comes to bugs, we obviously encourage regular communication via mailing list, but then what happens if your upstream is MySQL and the mailing list is quiet? Then you go to other mailing lists, like the MariaDB list or the, or the Percona list, which is actually gets a lot of traffic. Sometimes bug system CC us. That's the best thing we can get, right? Getting CC'd on bugs so that we know that there's a bug. If you don't tell us there's a bug, we, we will never know. There is no real clear dashboard. I think Launchpad was supposed to be this dashboard that actually amalgamated everything together. But that, that was the dream, but reality is we don't, we don't see that today. And uh, yeah, we also really don't get bugs that you, you, you see in distributions reported upstream, which is actually a real problem for us because we, we don't know what we don't know. We've mitigated all of this distribution problems by also making our own packages and, telling, and encouraging people to bypass distributions and use our own packages. And MySQL, for one, is very happy that this happened because now they have these stats of how many people are using their repositories and it's, it's a huge number, which they don't release. <laughs> <laughs> And, and this is again very true with Percona server. So Percona server doesn't even follow the, the mirror, mirror method. So we actually track 100% of all our downloads. So we can tell you, yes, we have 3 million downloads because that came through our system. Of course, we don't know if it, if it comes via distribution, but we know what comes from our system. And MariaDB server, it's, it's all through mirrors as well. So again, we don't have a really good number. And of course, our packages tend to have additional things as well, right? You know, maybe more engines, more plugins. These are things that sometimes distributions just choose not to build. And th there are good reasons why. Maybe there's no reason to, to do it, or maybe there's no reason to want to support 
other engines. Just okay. Taking a, a quick look um, at you know the Debian patch set as well as the, as the Fedora patch set, we, we still don't have uh, equivalence in terms of you know pa no patch no patches in distributions. This is always going to happen. And um, you know, inside of Debian, for example, we have patches that we see for the MySQL package to make it work on things like herd and k-free BSD, which which apparently does matter. But then we also, if I go go looking at patches really closely, sometimes we get you know really silly um, patches, which is just just fixing English. And there's no reason to to fix English in your package. That you should just fi you just report this upstream and get it fixed there. You don't have to run a patch to fix uh, a spelling error. I mean, we, we try to spell properly, but we fail sometimes. I, I spent uh, a long time, uh, so I saw, we saw MariaDB in, in 2009, and right up until 2016, I spent time focusing on replacing MySQL with MariaDB server in distributions. And the journey started in November of 2010, so maybe about eight or nine months after our first release. And it has, it has progressed tremendously into enterprise distributions and so forth. And Debian just started the journey for 10.1, which is why I said the Debian MySQL package maintainers mailing list is an awesome place to be now because you can see lots of bugs, lots of people complaining. If you like that sort of drama in your life, <laughs> it's, uh, it's well worth being there. But it's also really a statement to the amount of architectures and the amount of packages Debian has. We never saw this kind of pushback from Fedora. We totally see this from Debian because they'll tell you stuff on you know random weird hardware that doesn't even run Linux kernels apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I would say this this goal would probably be complete in, in 2017. So it would take it would take in seven years. Whereas if you look at LibreOffice, LibreOffice replaced OpenOffice and pretty much everything much quicker. And you know that's probably because LibreOffice was actually getting developed and OpenOffice wasn't. In this case, all three servers are getting developed and they're all getting better. And it's not infrastructure like a database. So that's true. It's end user right. software. But LibreOffice story is different because it is had a protocol ready all all build, correct. And all of them were shipping already that shipping that. that. Correct. And when the patch set became a full port, they just switched. Yes, it was much it was much easier for them. So this is a, a note um, March 23rd, 2016, where the Debian release team decided to make MariaDB the new default. And as I said, this is a still an ongoing thing now in, in, in February of 2017. But that's also a testament to how long it takes for Debian to make a, a, a release. It's, it's improved, though, I guess. And why? Why did Debian choose to switch to MariaDB? Back then, it made a lot of sense because there were things like you know test cases were were not being published, and Debian wanted security information published. Debian has actually ejected things like Elasticsearch out of the repository as well because they don't get security updates. Um, you know, we at one stage there were man pages silently silent, silently being relicensed away from a GPL, but this was actually just uh, a bug that was was fixed shortly thereafter, and. Um, I guess the most important thing was, was security. Security, security, security. And nowadays nobody really talks much about it, but um, it's reputedly that you know, MariaDB would be a little bit more open with security than, say, uh, MySQL. But this also poses a problem for users, a problem unlike what you'd get inside of, say, LibreOffice and OpenOffice, in the sense that MariaDB server is now not compatible with MySQL. It was compatible for quite some time, <laughs> but it is not compatible. And this creates real life problems that affect users. Users are saying things like, how come I can't use JSON functionality when I expect it to just work? I'm reading this article on the internet, but, my, my, but what is saying it's MySQL, which is really MariaDB, doesn't provide the functionality. They get angry, and they're going to get angry at you, not, not upstream. <laughs> so if you're, if you're a distribution, beware for this sort of thing. So yeah, bunch of missing features, a um, bunch of different features. So the on disk formats are changed. Um, also, what happens when upstream says, "Hey, we don't have enough time to work on something. You can't just you know orphan our packages I immediately. We, you, we need to know," and and so on. So, in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to say, yeah, distribution methods definitely evolve. 
Um, you know, even someone like Mark Shuttleworth keeps on trying to make new evolutions with, with Snap, for example. But a product without any distribution will definitely hurt its adoption potential. Oh, and if you happen to run MySQL 5.7, you will now see a warning like this. But this warning is, is the tip of the iceberg. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? We have time for probably one question. OK, one question, <laughs> if anyone has a question. <laughs> yes, question. You, you, mentioned when, uh, you mentioned something about offline, online problems with the package manager that you have to yeah. Oh, yeah. The question is uh, problems with offline installs. So sometimes in, in some environments, they say you can't get access to the Internet, so you have to download all these packages yourself manually and then install them. RPM, you, you can do, like, um, dependency resolution even when you're offline with YUM or what, what the new tool. But you can't do that with uh, dpackage. dpackage doesn't do dependency re resolution, so you have to install packages, like, one by one in the correct order, when they especially... Yeah. Does app work offline now? App install dev just works. Yeah. If you have all the devs. If you have all the devs, okay. Well, this this is a common com complaint we got from consultants. Yeah, it's it's also not a very common scenario where they tell you you can't work offline, you, that you must work offline. Yes. Do we have time for one more? Nope. No more time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.